good to see all of you here tonight, and I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you. I wish I'd known it's going to be more casual. Here I am. I look like a dead man, all dressed up, no place to go. But uh, Gary and Craig and uh, those of you who are comfy in your more casual clothing, you'll have to put up with me all dressed up. A while ago, Gary mentioned the Promise uh, Keepers, a movement that had a large impact for a good while in America and still is going. My book, God Gave Wine, my son told me, Dad, why don't you name that book Promise Drinkers? <laughs> but I didn't. I think Craig would have appreciated that, but we went ahead with God Gave Wine. Well, I've been asked to speak on the book of Revelation. I've been asked to deal with this 22-chapter book that's worth at least 40 uh, paintings. I've been asked to speak on it in three lectures. So we obviously can't study the details as we're here tonight. Uh, Revelation is big, it's difficult, and I'm working on a commentary right now that is going to be upwards of 800 or more pages. So I'm trying to compact this down into three lectures, so obviously you'll have to bear with me. The issues I'll be dealing with, though, are key issues essential to understanding Revelation, as well as being quite fascinating and interesting issues as you read Revelation. They're key matters that provide the very tools so that you can open and unlock what are called the mysteries of Revelation if those tools are correctly used. Now, this lecture will deal with two vital issues. And the first is John's stated expectation. That is, when does John expect these events that he's recording to transpire? And secondly, John's stated theme, which is, what is John's message that his readers must heed? These are the two key issues we'll be dealing with tonight. These are absolutely foundational to understanding the book, and I hope you'll be able to follow with me and see why they're so critical and how they are so helpful. I believe that without understanding these two issues, you really don't have a chance in understanding Revelation as John intended it. So listen carefully. I hope you'll check the scriptures when you get opportunity. Because of my short time, I will be moving quickly, but I've given you all the relevant Bible verses in your outlines there, and I hope you'll follow those. I may be challenging your most basic assumptions regarding the meaning of Revelation, but I do hope you will follow and give me your ears for just a while. Let's begin by considering John's temporal expectation. When does John expect his prophecies to occur? This is the question before us. And this is very important to the proper interpretation of Revelation. Now there are three factors that emphasize the historical circumstances of John's original audience. And this is very important for us to lay down at the beginning. John wrote to those whom he knew and to those over whom he ministered. We must put ourselves back in the first century sandals of his original audience if we are to have any hope at all for understanding what John was telling them. I will build my case brick by brick. When I open with the building of the case, you might wonder, well, so what? Where is this going? But I hope that once we've got enough bricks out, you'll see the foundation, and then we'll be building up the superstructure as we continue on in the next two lectures as well. So let's consider audience relevance. And first, notice the church's address. He wrote to seven historical first century churches, very clearly. These are particular historical, concrete individual churches that existed in the first century. In Revelation 1.4, by the way, you'll want to be open to Revelation 1, perhaps. In Revelation 1.4, it says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. These are seven churches which are in Asia. In verse 11, he says, what you see, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia to Ephesus, to Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardius, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So these are seven particular churches. These are historical churches that existed in John's day and churches to whom he wrote. In fact, in chapters 2 and 3, Jesus himself writes those letters 
to the seven churches, and he addresses them with specific exhortations, and he touches on particular historical events in their lives, their geographical setting, and the political illusions that they well know. And so these are real first century Christians that received this book originally. Keep that in mind as we build the case. Secondly, the church is afflicted. John and those first century churches were already suffering tribulation. In fact, in Revelation 1 verse 9 we read, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in the tribulation. John is writing from the Isle of Patmos where he'd been banished. And he says, I am your brother, I'm your companion in tribulation. They are suffering just as he is suffering. Therefore, Revelation has a very deep concern for martyrs throughout. There are many references in the book to martyrs and those who have given their, faith, their life for Christ in faith. But I just want to focus on one early passage. Revelation 6, verses 9 and 11, to save us time, says... And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Slain for the word of God and the testimony which they held. In verse 11, And it was said to them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. John clearly is writing to a persecuted church suffering under grave circumstances. He mentions those martyrs already in heaven and he tells them that they must wait a little while longer because more are coming into heaven to be with them. When John writes to these suffering churches regarding their martyrdom and further coming martyrs through their corridors, the question arises, is he therefore speaking to them about events that are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years in the future? Or is he going to be dealing with circumstances that matter to those first century churches who are giving their brothers up in martyrdom? Thirdly, the church is instructed. The church is instructed. John wrote to be understood. The title of the book arises from the first sentence, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants the things which must shortly take place. Notice two things at this point. He said it is a revelation. The word for revelation, apocalypsis in the Greek, means to uncover, to unveil, to expose to view, to open something to understanding. Furthermore, he not only calls it an unveiling so that they might see something, but he says he's uncovering these things in order to show them. And so particularly he is uncovering in order to show them certain things. His point is he is showing those persecuted believers of the first century who are near and dear to him, who are companions in tribulation. He is showing them something. He's not hiding things from them. He is not writing about nuclear warfare in the future, Cobra helicopters, America, and things that these people know nothing about. Notice verse 3 also. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things written in it. The first century church that received these letters, they were to read them to the congregation. And his point is that they must hear what he has to say in order they, they might heed what he has them, uh, is calling them to do. So they must hear in order to understand so that they may act as first century believers. Now John originally wrote to afflicted churches so that they might understand something, so that they might do something, so that they might uh, organize their lives appropriately. Again, we should recognize that it is highly unlikely in light of the original audience that he's writing about events that are thousands of years off in the future. So that leads me to speak about his contemporary expectation. This is probably the most important matter for understanding the book of Revelation. And I, I don't see how anybody can look at these verses and come to any other conclusion. 
John expressly tells us in his opening three verses that he expects the events of Revelation to begin occurring soon. Not in the distant future, in his lifetime, in the lifetime of his original hearers. And I want to note four angles that emphasize the contemporary expectation of John. The first is this. John employs varied expressions to emphasize the nearness of the events. Two different terms are particularly used by John. Those are the words in English, shortly and near. Notice the first term. The, the Greek word for shortly is tachos. Your tachometer on the car tells how fast your engine is going. Well, tachos means shortly or, or quickly. And so it's a term that means that something's about to happen quickly. In verse 1, the, now notice this is the opening salvo of John in this glorious book. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants, the things which must shortly take place. You suffering Christians who are my friends and are companions with me in tribulation, I am telling you these things must shortly take place. The Arndt and Gingrich lexicon, the leading uh, lexicon in Greek studies today, tells us that the word takos, which is translated here shortly, means speed, at once, without delay, soon, a short time. You can, you can check it out in the Orton Gingrich lexicon. In fact, I challenge you to go check any modern translation that you have. Any, I don't care if it's King James, New King James, New International Version, English Standard Version, Revised Standard Version. You check any version. They will always say something to the effect that this is shortly to take place. Bar none. Check them out. Because this is the key verse in the book of Revelation for understanding it. This word appears in not only in 1.1, but in 2.6, 3.11, 22.6, 7.12, 12, and 20. John clearly stated that these things are shortly to take place. Then the second term he uses is the Greek word ingus. It actually is at arm. It means at arm. At arm's length is the idea behind this. And it's the word translated as near in verse 3. Notice verse 3. Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of the prophecy, and heeds the things which are written in it, for the time is near. And the very next verse talks about the seven churches in Asia. He has just told them, blessed is that reader up front, and blessed are you if you hear the things that are read because of a very important issue. The time is near. If you do not understand the one term, then surely you could understand the other. They mutually support one another. These things are surely to come to pass because the time is near. Only one verse separates verse 1 from verse 3. They're right at the very front and they clearly imply and demand temporal nearness. How else could John have said it if he had wanted to tell them these events were shortly to come pa to pass? How else could he have said it? He used the two most common words that you could possibly use to declare it. Remember, these are first century Christians that are suffering simultaneously, simultaneously with John. How would they have read it and understood it? Put yourselves back in the first century. But don't look at that man when the camera flashes. That is one bright flash. He about blinded me for a second. Why would I look at that guy? Okay, if you put yourself back in the first century and read this book without Hal Lindsey on your right hand or Tim LaHaye on your left, if you read it, you would think these things are shortly to come to pass. That's exactly what John intended for the people to think. So in the first place, the contemporary, expect, contemporary expectation is underscored by the varied expressions that he uses, these two particular expressions. In the second place, John engages in strategic placement to emphasize the nearness of the events. Not only does he use these two very clear terms to identify the time frame, but he places them in the opening of the book, in the closing of the book, in its introduction, in its conclusion, he states his expectation as he begins. He states it again and repeats it as he closes the book. He prepares them in the opening of the book. 
and he reminds them in the closing of the book, Revelation chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 22 have parallel themes here. Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his bondservants the things which must shortly take place. Revelation 22.6, the words, these words are faithful and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which must shortly take place in the opening and in the conclusion. Chapter 1, verse 3, where he says, Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear, and those who keep the words of the prophecy, for the time is near. Chapter 22, verse 10. He said to me, the angel, he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of the book, for the time is near. Also note that this is pre and post drama. It might be that in the highly wrought imagery of Revelation that it's difficult for us to grasp some of the images. But not in the first sentence. Not in the last few sentences where he's not even gotten into that imagery yet. He is simply introducing the book. It's very important for us to note that. John is actually forbidding the reader to expect these events to be off in the distant future. And thirdly, John provides significant instruction to emphasize the nearness. Revelation differs from Daniel at, at this very important point. In Daniel 12.4, as Daniel's concluding his book, we read, As for you, Daniel, conceal these words, seal them up, seal up the book until the end of time. In Revelation 22.10, the angel says to John, we read, He said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. The exact opposite command is given to John, as was given much earlier to Daniel. And that opposite conclusion is, you must not in any way seal this book because the time is near. What could be clearer? And notice fourthly, John offers frequent repetition of this theme of nearness in the book. John is very serious. He is emphatic. There is a relentless drumbeat through the book of Revelation that these things are coming upon the scene. <clears throat> And we must feel that drumbeat. In verse 1, of course, these things are shortly to take place. Verse 3, the time is near. Chapter 3, verse 11, I am coming quickly. Chapter 6, verse 11, there was given to each of them a robe that the, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer. Chapter 10, verse 6, he swore by him who lives forever and ever that there should be delay no longer. 22, 6, the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which must shortly take place. 22, 7, behold, I am coming quickly. 12 says the same thing, and, chapter, and verse 20 says the same thing. <clears throat> Revelation emphasizes those events. <clears throat> Craig, I might need some water. Could you give me some? <clears throat> water, Craig. Now don't get my God gave wine book and bring me something else. <clears throat> Revelation emphasizes the events are near. He emphasizes it in the opening of the book, in the conclusion of the book. He says, don't seal it. And he repeatedly throughout the book tells the people these things are shortly, quickly to come to pass or whatever. Well, let's consider now the modern Christian's common objection. Some will object, well, yes, John does say these things are shortly to come to pass, but he's speaking about God's timing, not man's timing. He's speaking uh, of God's eternal perspective on things. In God's eyes, these things are near or shortly to come to pass. After all, does not Scripture teach us in 2 Peter 3, verse 8, that, <clears throat> that a thousand years with the Lord is as but a day? Well, surely it does. How shall we respond? Thank you, Craig. Well, this is the way you respond to that objection. John is writing to men. Peter is writing about God. Peter expressly says, to God it is this way. But John is not giving a theological discussion about God. He is writing to men and telling them there are certain things that they must do and keep and heed. Peter is stating a theological truth. John is urging human warnings. 
Furthermore, John is writing to seven specific churches about dire circumstances. He says that they are in tribulation in chapter 1, verse 9, 2, verses 9 and 10, and verse 13. <clears throat> He says you need patience in chapter 1, 9, 2, verses 2 and 3, verse 10, 13, 25, and 3, verses 10 and 11. He speaks of their expectation of judgment in chapter 2, verse 5, 16 and 25, chapter 3, verse 3, 11, 22, 10, and 18 through 19. He's writing to these people who are, he's telling them they're in tribulation, they need to exercise patience, they are to expect judgments. He would be mercilessly taunting them if they discovered, you know what, I think John's talking about what's happening 2,000 years from now. That would be a merciless taunt of these people in their circumstances. God is answering the cry of the martyr in chapter 6, verses 10 and 11, when they cry out, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not avenge our blood upon those who dwell upon the earth? And the answer comes, wait a little while longer. Some who have already died are in heaven and the imagery is that they're crying out to God how long? And the answer comes as they're given robes. They are blessed by God. Wait a little while longer. Not thousands of years. Besides the time references are in the didactic sections. They're frequent. They're varied. Again, all English translations agree. If only interpreters would look at the first three verses, just those three verses of Revelation, they would have a whole new vista on Revelation. Well, all right, let's consider now John's literary theme. Because now we've stated that these events are shortly to come to pass. Well, what is the overarching, what is the driving theme of the book that John is writing about? To determine the theme of a written document, it's important that you see what the writer himself wanted you to understand to be his theme. John states early, and in the introduction to the book, which is very complex admittedly, he states early that he, there is a particular theme he's dealing with, and verse 7 is that theme. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Now, despite the initial appearance, which I grant, this verse is not talking about the second coming of Christ in the future. I believe in a second advent. I believe Jesus is coming. I don't believe history goes on forever and ever and ever and ever, and sin is forever in God's universe. I believe there is a conclusion to history I believe that. But, I do not believe that this verse is talking about the second coming of Christ. Rather, John is prophesying Jesus' judgment coming against the Jews in the year 70 when he destroys their temple by use of the Roman armies. The Jews who had rebelled against him and had crucified the Messiah, it's their judgment that he's speaking of. In Hebrews 8, verse 13, we find a verse that tells us that Israel's ceremonial system, their temple structure, is about to be done away with. In Hebrews 8, 13, we read, When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. And he's telling those Jewish Christians who are apostatizing back into Judaism, He's telling them, don't go back into Judaism. These things of the Old Covenant are becoming obsolete. They're ready to disappear. You're going the wrong direction in your spiritual life if you're going back into Judaism. See, the temple was still standing at the, t at the time he wrote. The year 70, A.D. 70, ended biblical Judaism. The Jews have not been able to follow the Old Testament regarding the sacrificial system in the temple since the year 70 when the temple was destroyed. That was it for biblical Judaism. And it secured the full inclusion of the Gentiles into the kingdom of God through spiritual worship. But why do I say that Revelation 1 verse 7 does not speak of the second advent? 
since it could very well be speaking of the second advent if it weren't in this context just to take the verse out of it it would look like the second advent and I grant that why do I suggest that he is speaking of AD 70 well I want to give you several reasons and the first is this and I believe that these taken together demand an AD 70 understanding of this passage first the preceding context just a few verses before verse 7 he says these events are shortly to take place because the time is near within just a few words he has said that now it would be odd that if two times in the opening of the book he said the events were near it would be quite odd if when he gets to the theme just a few verses later the theme has to do with something thousands of years in the future he has just told them the events are near now he's giving them the theme of the book how could the events be near if the themes about something very distant it would be a remarkable absurdity and secondly the following context you've got verse 1 saying this is shortly to take place verse 3 saying the time is near verse 7 says behold he's coming with the clouds and judgment and then what you have in the following context verse 9 he says I John your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance this theme of verse 7 which was introduced as being near this theme of verse 7 must have relevance to those people in verse 9 who are going to be who are suffering tribulation with John how could he have a theme to those people and a, a theme for the book that he wrote to those people that has to do with something thousands of years in the future it just doesn't make sense surely the judgment theme spoken of here Jesus coming in clouds of judgment surely it is relevant to the historical trials of the first century church thirdly the apocalyptic language notice that it says he is coming with the clouds now here in this language we might immediately think and rightly so oh this is the second advent Acts 1 says he will come in the same manner that he left he's coming on the clouds of heaven and we read of his coming in glory in various passages of Scripture well here we need to understand the apocalyptic character of the imagery apocalyptic language is language that is designed to be dramatic and symbolic and involve imagery and we find in Scripture very often divine judgments upon men in history are very often spoken of in dramatic apocalyptic language as if God himself is personally coming down to judge in fact we find in Scripture that natural catastrophes are often dramatic imageries of God's wrath among men in Micah 1 3 we have what Micah tells us is an oracle against Samaria and Judah and it has to do with the Babylonian conquest and yet we read and this happened in the Old Testament long ago we read behold the Lord is coming forth from his place he will come down and tread on the high places of the earth the mountains will melt under him and the valleys will be split like wax uh, before the fire like water poured down a steep place what he's saying here is in Babylon's coming conquest of Samaria and Judah he's saying don't just look at it through the eyes of the secularist the natural man saying well there's a big kingdom defeating a little kingdom this happens all the time in history no he says God is coming down to tread down you because you have sinned against your maker your creator and so he gives a theological interpretation to the events that are being governed by God's throne above and it is called the Lord coming and yet no Christian that I've ever met no scholar I've ever read says that when the Babylonians conquered uh, Jerusalem when they conquered Judea that God they actually saw God with great vision of God and he's stomping on the mountains and melting them and crushing people that doesn't happen but the image is that it's the crushing blow that Babylon brings upon them is really God crushing them down for their great sin Isaiah 19 is almost an exact parallel in some respects to chapter 1 verse 7 of Revelation yet 
it speaks of God's Old Testament judgment upon Egypt. Isaiah 19.1 says, The burden against Egypt, very clearly, the burden against Egypt. Behold, the Lord rides a swift cloud and will come down to Egypt, and the idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence. Nobody I have ever read says that the Egyptians, when they were conquered back then by Esar Haddon, if you're interested in who did it, no commentator would say, well, God, they saw a vision of God in the clouds riding down and knocking over their idols. That's not what happened. But when Esar Haddon came in and destroyed Egypt, the interpretation of the, uh, the eyes of the prophet was that that was God at work. This was not an accident of history. It's not might makes right. It is God coming down, riding on a storm cloud of judgment against Egypt. Okay, so that's, that's the imagery there. You see, destructive storm clouds were strong images of judgment. Just like anybody has, who watched the TV last year when Katrina was destroying uh, with the broken levees and all that, New Orleans. So much damage, so that I can imagine the people down there, next time a hurricane cloud comes their way, they're going to be terrified. Somebody who's experienced it would feel the, the uh, terror of such an event. Such is a good image of the judgment of God riding upon a cloud. Fourthly, the Lord's teaching. God uses coming language regarding Israel's judgment in A.D. 70. In Matthew 21, verses 40 and following, Jesus provides a parable of Jewish rebellion against God and His prophets. And in that parable, which we don't have time to go in in detail, He is pointing to the year 70, to A.D. 70, as a coming. He uses the language, a coming, that is a divine visitation. When Jesus, Jesus says this in the parable, when He's talking about the parable of vineyard, He says, when the owner of the vineyard comes, notice the language comes, the owner of the vineyard, the vineyard is Israel, the owner is God, I think most Christians recognize that when they read the parable there. When the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to, to those vine dressers, that is the leaders of Israel? And his audience said, they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard out to other vine dressers who will render to him fruits in their seasons. Then in verse 43 we read Jesus saying, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And then in verse 45, the Pharisees, we read, Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived he was speaking of them. Jesus was speaking of the coming destruction of Jerusalem where God is taking the kingdom from Israel, from its religious leaders, and turning it over to the Gentiles, of which all of us here, I suppose, are a part, unless there's some of Jewish extraction here. When the owner of the vineyard comes, that's the coming of the Roman armies under the leadership of God's providential plan. And so the Lord's teaching is such that when he talks about the destruction of Israel as the vineyard, he speaks of it in terms of language coming. All commentators agree with this. And therefore, not only is it possible that uh, Revelation 1-7 speaks of the coming with the clouds. Not only is it possible that it's talking about Jesus' coming in A.D. 70, but it's very likely since Jesus had already plowed that ground. Fifthly, the specific cause. In chapter 1, verse 7, we find that, Behold, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see Him, even those who pierced Him. He's coming against those who pierced Him. He's coming with the clouds, every eye will see Him, and the Greek here can and should, I believe, be translated, even those who pierced him. That is, those who pierced him. Now, who pierced Jesus? Well, physically, the Romans are the ones who drove the nails in his hands. But covenantally, we must ask the question, why were the Romans there driving the nails in the hands of Jesus? It's because of the instigation of the Jews. In June, uh, John 19.15, we read, crucify him, crucify him, we have no king but Caesar. Matthew 7, uh, 27, 25, his blood be upon us and our children, crucify him. You, you remember Pilate wanted to let him go. But the Jews insisted. And they said, you are no friend of Caesar's if you release him. Give us Barabbas. Peter at Pentecost says in Acts 2, 23, 
This man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men. Now the hands of the godless men, the Romans actually did it. But notice the onus falls upon the Jews. Peter is speaking at Pentecost in Jerusalem and says, you nailed him to the cross. Oh, you used the hands of godless men, but you are the ones responsible. And Peter says to the high priest in Acts 5.30, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. The same thing is said in Acts 3, 13 through 15, 752, 10.39. Paul says it in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 14 through 16. The idea here is the Jews are covenantally responsible. They are covenantally guilty. They demanded, they instigated, they caused, they ensured the piercing of Christ and his death. And A.D. 70 is the time in which he came against them to judge them for having pierced him. Those Jews are long dead. Those who pierced him have been dead for hundreds upon hundreds of years. And therefore it must have been shortly in John's perspective that Christ came in judgment against them because otherwise he would not be coming against those who pierced him. Sixthly, the ultimate focus. Notice verse 7 says, All tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Who are these tribes and why are they mourning? Well, the Greek here, the earth, all tribes of the earth, is the Greek teskes, which mean, can be translated either the earth or the land. That is, the particular land, the designation of the land of Israel. In fact, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, Israel is known as a people composed of 12 tribes. In fact, in Revelation 7, he talks about the 12 tribes of Israel and names those tribes. He is coming against those who pierced him, and the tribes of the land, the Jewish tribes, shall mourn because of him. Jesus often warns of Israel's approaching judgment. Now I want to just read quickly three statements in Luke. Luke 19, verses 41 through 44. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this year, this your day, the things that make for your excuse me, make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you and surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. He is talking to those people about A.D. 70. We know that A.D. 70 destroyed Jerusalem and devastated the temple. In Luke 21, verses 20 through 22, Jesus says, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that its desolation is near. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the, <coughs> in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance. Luke 23, 28 through 31. Jesus is carrying his cross, and the daughters of Jerusalem weep. And Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which you will say, Blessed are the barren, wombs that never bore, and breasts which never nurse. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. The mourning of the tribes of the land is the mourning of Israel because of the events of A.D. 70. The coming of Jesus in the clouds against those who pierced him causes mourning in the tribes of Israel and the land. And seventhly, the particular parallel. Revelation 1-7 has a parallel in Matthew 24. And it's clear that Matthew 24 is dealing with AD 70. And I'll show that in just a moment. Both Revelation 1 7 and Matthew 24 30 do something that's unique in all of Scripture. They both merge verses from the Old Testament, Daniel 7 13 and Zechariah 12 10. Revelation 1 7 says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. 
Okay, the coming with clouds from Daniel 7.13. Uh, the tribes of the earth mourning from Zechariah 12.10. But notice Matthew 24.30. All the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. The same two ideas from the same two Old Testament passages. There's a parallel between, between Revelation 1.7 and Revel Matthew 24.30. Now notice this. Matthew 24 is clearly speaking of the destruction of the temple. In verse 1, the disciples come out and point to him the beautiful stones of the temple. In verse 2, he says, See all these things? I tell you, not one will be left on another that will not be thrown down. In verse 3, they say, When shall these things be? And then he goes off into this long Olivet Discourse. And then in verse 30, finally, in verse 30, he speaks of, uh, he says, All the tribes of the land, literally, will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Four verses later, after he says that, four verses later, he says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Thus both Matthew 24, 34, I'm sorry, Matthew 24, 30, and, and Revelation 1, 7, are encompassed with near-time indicators that demand that the events were to transpire in the lifetime of the original hearers. All right. Now, Finally, let's notice the fulfillment of the theme event. What are the results of the judgment coming of Christ? Why are they so dramatically put as if it's Jesus coming on the clouds of heaven? Why is it so dramatically put? First, consider the judgment for the Jewish population. In Josephus' Wars of the Jews, Josephus was a first century Jewish historian who witnessed the destruction of the temple. In his Wars of the Jews, he reports that 1.1 million Jews died. I, I challenge you, I encourage you, if you're interested in this, to get Josephus' Wars of the Jews and read books 4 through 7. Particularly, you'll find so many parallels to Revelation, it'll be remarkable. In fact, in my Revelation commentary, almost on every page, I'm citing Josephus and paralleling what he's saying to what John is prophesying. Many hundreds and thousands of the Jews were paraded in Rome in chains. They were mocked. They were spit upon. They were thrown to the lions. Tens of thousands of Jews were sold into slavery, so much so that uh, the slavery a community in all the Roman Empire was glutted and the price of slaves fell. Uh, historian von Mosheim <coughs> says, throughout the whole history of the human race we meet with but few, if any, instances of slaughter or devastation at all to be compared with this. The Jewish people suffered a horrific judgment in the first century. A horrible judgment and it was because they had rejected the Messiah. And secondly, the judgment upon Jewish religious culture. The holy city of Israel was destroyed. The Roman siege warfare that was waged against Jerusalem was horrific in terms of its capacity to destroy. The destruction of the temple led to the final conclusive cessation of the sacrificial system which was ordained in the Old Testament. The covenantal loss of Israel is this. They cannot worship God in His temple as He ordained in the Old Testament. They cannot do it. The final removal of the simple, uh, central temple is such that it has never been rebuilt. And the New Testament anticipates this. Matthew 24, 2. Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another that will not be thrown down. John 4, 21. Jesus said to the woman at the well, Believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. In other words, Jerusalem is about to be removed as a place of central worship. Hebrews 8.13, again, He has made the first obsolete, and whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Revelation today in the modern evangelical environment is almost universally misinterpreted because Christians don't use the keys to unlock the mysteries. John states clearly and often these events are near, they're shortly to come to pass. They're not 2,000 years distant. John's theme strongly applies to AD 70. Revelation is not about our future, but about our past. It was about John's future and the future for his first century audience, but that has now come to pass. My motto to you is this. 
left behind, that's what you should do to that book series when you go in a bookstore. Leave it behind and get out. They confuse and they obscure what the book of Revelation is all about. Thank you.